It's always interesting to me how big of a role the wilderness plays in Scripture. From the very beginning, we see the wilderness. We see a God who meets us in the wilderness. And when we talk about the wilderness, we think of a place that is, I guess, dangerous and scary. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to even grasp the idea of of what the wilderness is as we live in this age where we really don't have to go out into the wilderness too often. And I always think that the only time usually that I ever really go into the wilderness is, you know, once every two years that I leave society, I kind of get in my car, and I travel northwards. And the next thing you know, I arrive in Clemson, South Carolina. And I'm in the middle of nowhere. But uh, as a Gamecock, I, I, I uh, always have to, to go there. But uh, the wilderness is some place that, that we really, it's hard for us to grasp. And maybe sometimes we go on vacation to the wilderness, or, or maybe um, the wilderness is an exciting place. But the wilderness is also scary because we don't have the comforts that we are used to, and we don't have the safety measures that we are used to. And the wilderness in Scripture was very much a similar experience. It was a dangerous place. It was a place where you did not know what was going to happen. And we think about the Israelites who are in the wilderness for 40 years. They're just wandering around, uncertain about where they're going, uncertain how they're going to get there, uncertain really if God is leading them or if they have a crazed man who's just taking them in circles. And then we also find the wilderness playing an important role several hundred years later, when Elijah has just battled the great prophets of Baal, and he is down on his luck. And so he goes out into the wilderness, uncertain what his own ministry will hold, uncertain, you know, what the future is for the people known as Israelites. And so he leaves behind society, and he goes to the wilderness to die. He goes to sit under a tree and he says, Lord, take my life that I am so uncertain that I would rather die than to keep going. And we see the wilderness as a place where Jesus goes to right after he is baptized. He gets up and he goes out into the wilderness. And for 40 days and for 40 nights, he was out there and he encountered the devil And he encountered the uncertainty of what held for his ministry and for his soon-to-be followers. And so he sat in the wilderness. We don't forget the wilderness in our own lives or in the lives of the church. Because the wilderness kind of grabs us and it shakes us to our very core. And the wilderness we encounter, the deserted places, is not so much a physical location but rather it's a state of heart because the wilderness is a time of uncertainty and of wandering. And many of us have been in the wilderness or we might be in the wilderness right now where we feel isolated from one another, isolated from God and isolated from the comforts that God has given us. And so we remember the wilderness because it leaves such a lasting imprint on our psyche. And The only other time where I really lived in the wilderness for a summer was when I was a camp counselor at Asbury Hills. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of Asbury Hills. It's a camp just outside of Traveler's Rest. And as I was driving in, I I left the University of South Carolina, kind of the big city of Columbia, and I went to the middle of, of nowhere. And I remember as I was getting closer to the campsite, I looked down and my cell phone had no service. And I realized, you know, that this is nothing. And as kind of, I guess, the, the city kid, I realized I was the only kid from the USC. Everybody else was from like Clemson and Furman. And I quickly noticed that, that I was not prepared for this wilderness journey. Because I noticed they all had like the state-of-the-art packs. They had the state-of-the-art hiking shoes. And they had like these clothes that would dry super quick. And, and here I am in board shorts and some rainbow sandals and a hat on backwards. And... You know, my school book bag with some bungee cords and my, my sleeping bag was bigger than, you know, probably the rest of the campsite's bags put together. And for some reason, they looked at me and they thought, you'd be a great wilderness counselor. 
And I was like, uh, no, I think I'd be good, you know, sitting in the campsite, kind of leading the little kids around. They're like, no, we're, what we're going to do is send you out. You'll camp out every night. You'll cook their food. And I remember the first night we went out, and I'm in, I'm in the middle of this wilderness, and as we're walking out, and I have these kids, and, and they look scared to death because it's their first time going out. And I'm trying to like be like, I'm not scared to death. I have this. And as I'm walking, one of the guys comes up. He nonchalantly says, hey, man, check out this tree. And so I walk up to the tree, and the next thing I know, I see about eight feet up this big claw mark. And he's like, we had a bear come through here a couple days ago, and he was sharpening his claws on the tree. And I kept thinking, I want to be back in Columbia right now. <laughs> the only wilderness I want to see is the golf course. And um, I remember sitting there that whole night thinking, I don't know what this summer holds. I don't know where we're going to go tomorrow, how we're going to get the fire started if it's rainy. And I remember that there was a lot of uncertainty. And I was kind of deserted that night as all the kids had fallen asleep. And I was left with my thoughts of, what is going to happen? Well, what lies ahead? And in this passage this morning, we find Jesus going to a deserted place because he wants to get away. He wants that time to actually sit and wrestle with the question, to embrace the uncertainty of his ministry, to embrace the wandering aspect that we as disciples of Christ are called to embrace. And so he goes into the wilderness to get away, to think about what has happened. For he has just left Nazareth, his hometown, and they weren't too happy with him. He kind of ruffled their feathers, and they ended up basically running him out of town. And then we see Jesus hearing about how Herod has found out about him. And back in the Roman Empire, which is understandable, when someone starts professing to be the king of the Jews, to be a king, and people start following him, the Roman Empire notices that very quickly because their number one job is to quell these kind of individuals. And he's starting to hear rumors that King Herod hears that Jesus is causing an uproar in the countryside. And so Jesus goes off to the deserted place so that he can kind of regather himself and pray. But before he can even get there, he looks out from his boat and he sees Thousands of people chasing after him. I, I can't imagine what it would look like to be in a boat and to look out and to see all these people coming just to see him. And the reason why these people were coming, because in the person of Jesus Christ, that they had found hope, real hope, that they had found real joy, that they had found peace. And they were willing to leave everything, to leave the certainty of their homes, to leave their occupations, to leave the comforts, and to go out into the wilderness just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And so Jesus does not even have time to process what's going on. He doesn't have time to talk to his disciples to find out, you know, what do they think about this or, or what's going on? Because we all know what a joy it is to be able to, to talk with our friends and our brothers and sisters to, to try to figure out what's going on in our life and where God is meeting us. And he didn't have any of this time. But rather, they start bringing him the sick right as he docks the boat. And I mean, so many of us, we try to take some time for ourselves. And the next thing we know, a family member comes in the room. Our cell phone goes off. There's some important message that we have to take. And before we know it, the time that we had hoped to cherish is gone. And Jesus looks and says, it's okay that you're coming here. And he has compassion on them. Because he doesn't just see a crowd of people. He sees a crowd of hurting people. People who are sick. People who are lost. People who are confused. And he enters into the midst of that crowd. And he heals them. And it says that he heals all of the sick. That he sat there, and, and I guess it was probably early morning, and he's sitting there and he's healing. And he's ministering to them. And then when it's all done, and everyone is at peace, the disciples come up and they have a question. What are we to do with these people now? You know, we, we came here to get away. We came here to have time, and now we have all these people that we are responsible for. And Jesus looks at them, 
and kind of says, are you missing the point? Because you all were members of that crowd. You all were hurting at one point. And in essence, we are all members of that crowd. We have all come to seek Jesus. That's why we are here in worship today, to seek Jesus, to seek his healing touch, to be made whole in our worship, in our fellowship, in our time together. And we're also reminded that we, like the crowd, are called to take risk to follow, to go at all expenses to meet Jesus where he is and to be able to be in his presence. And so as the crowd went out into the desert, they realized that in these places in the wilderness of life, that when we feel like we are alone, we realize that God has been there the entire time. As the Israelites are in the desert, they realize God is right here with us. God is the one who has been providing our very needs. He has given us food in the morning. He has given us protection at night. And when Elijah fell asleep, God woke him up and said, Elijah, I'm not done with you. Don't give up on me because I have not given up on you. And in the wilderness, we find God looking the devil in the face and saying, your promises are lies. Your gifts are not gifts at all. Your power is is powerless. And in the wilderness of Asbury Hills, I encountered a real God who was there with me, who protected us from the bears and from all everything else. We didn't lose anybody, thanks be to God. But I realized that God had already gone before me. And that place that felt so lonely that first night became a place that was holy ground as I realized that God was in that presence. And in our own lives, In those moments when we feel deserted, when we feel like God has abandoned us, when we feel like our family and our friends have abandoned us, we realize that God is in our midst and God is ministering to us and healing our spiritual, physical, and emotional needs. And once we are healed, and once we have been in the presence of God, we don't remain in that crowd but rather we are called out and brought forward and we become disciples, just like the original 12 disciples. And so here we find the disciples wrestling with their new identity, wrestling with their new occupation, and they're, and they're worried because they look around and they see that, that, that there are all these people that are now filled with joy, but they know soon that that joy will give way to more pain and hurting as they become hungry. And us as members of the church, as Christ's holy people, we can kind of feel the same way sometimes. As we look out and we see all of these hurting people, as we start listing everything we need to do, that the list is endless, that we can't accomplish it on our own. And so the disciples come to Jesus and say, it'd be easier to send them away than for us to bother with them right now. And Jesus looks at them, and Jesus says, oh, you go ahead and feed them. And they say, well, we, we, we only have five fish and two loaves, or five loaves and two, I want to really say five fish this morning. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. We don't have the ability to do it. And Jesus says, bring that here. And so Jesus prays over the bread, he prays over the fish, and he blesses them. And that same Jesus prays over us and blesses us. And so he looks at the disciples and he says, you go feed them. The people who fed the people were the disciples. They were a part of the miracle that day. It was the power of Jesus working in and through them. But they were the ones who were distributing the bread. And that God is still living. That God who is at work in Jesus Christ is still at work in us still healing us, still using us, still saying, go and feed them. Don't worry about how it won't happen, that you cannot outgive my giving, that my grace is so abundant that you cannot even wrap your minds around it. Just give. Just feed the people. 
And so the disciples went out into the crowd and they distributed the food. And they met those people in the wilderness. They met those people in a dislocated place. And the place that had seemed so scary at one time became a great banquet. It became a party. And Jesus is calling us to go, to take care of the needs of the people, to meet the people who are in the wilderness of life, who feel deserted, who feel lonely. And he says, go, I will work through you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.